Good evening, everybody. How are you? Welcome to our fifth GP Trainee Update webinar. I hope you're well. I hope you're doing good. Hello, some people have started to mention things. Hi, Alina. Hi, Abba. Hi, Sujata. Hi, Alina. Hi, Rajesh. Hi, Suki. Hi, James. Hi, Rana. Hi, Nirajan. Good to see some familiar names. I'm getting used to some people who are ever regulars at our webinars. So welcome back. Welcome to all new people. There are a lot of new names I'm seeing right now. Hey guys, how are you doing? Um, I think I want to give people a few minutes. We've got about 180 on. There's about 400 signups. So I want to give people a few minutes. I know it's um, fast breaking time at the moment. So um, I hope it's all going well for all you guys who are fasting right now. If you have managed to join us and you're breaking your fast right now, then I hope this is going to be worth your time. Where are you guys calling from? Let me know. Are you ST1, ST2, ST3? Are you non GP trainee? Are you planning to be GP trainee? what is the audience we've got today so we've got a lot of st2s a lot of st3s newcastle cardiff nottingham manchester london got some plabbers in the house well done plab two plab one harlow wales stoke on trent warrington oxford kenya fantastic oman fantastic um essex wales lots of st2s lots of st3s any st1 say hello if you're an st1 petersfield kings lynn SD1, fantastic. Hi, Shane. How are you doing? Good. So we've got loads and loads and loads and loads of GP trainees. We're up to 200 now. Just waiting for a few more to come on board. Just give me a shout if this is your first of these webinars. Let me know if this is the first one that you're attending. Oh, yeah, quite a few first people on today. Welcome. Hope you're doing good. Second, third, all five, all five, all. Yeah, lots of you coming for your fifth one, which is great. Now my little baby has just woken up so I can hear him screaming. I don't know if that's coming across on your side. Um, apologies. Um, again, as with our previous webinars, we are going to get some strange sounds, probably from our children. No, it's not coming to you. That's good. So he's not uh, doing it loud enough. But it may well happen at some point. So I reckon another 60 seconds and we will start. Um, how's your day? How have you been? How are you managing this situation right now? I know it must be challenging. Give me some feedback. How are you coping? How you been emotionally, physically, uh, mentally? How are you doing? Busy, mentally drained. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, relentless, day off, tired, stress, working. Exercise helps. Yes, I agree. Exercise does help. Kids are more tiring. <laughs> Good to see some of you guys have got some some super spirit because um yeah someone said that sunday any news about csa we're going to be talking about an exam update in a second there'll be some news that's come out uh in the last hour actually well not quite news but a bit of an update and i'll be i'll be going through that in a second um but it must be hard trying to prepare for exams how many of you guys are preparing for exams right now because i know a lot of you guys are st2 probably akt st3 probably csa i presume yeah, lots of you praying for AKT and CSA. Okay, so we're up to about 208, 209. So I think we will go. It's 835. Can you see the screen change? Just let me know. Yes, if you can, just so I know you're seeing what I'm seeing. Good. Okay. So if you guys are on your first webinar, and there are quite a few of you, if you want to watch back our previous ones, you can. We're on our fifth one now. I've covered cardiology, ENT, respiratory, psychiatry. Um, they're all on this webpage, auroramedicaleducation.co.uk slash lockdown webinars, where you basically signed up for this one. Um, at the bottom are all of our previous ones, and this one will go there as well tomorrow, or maybe tonight, depends on how, how I get by after this. And also, we've got a How to Stay Motivated for Exams Facebook Live that we do. We're doing another Facebook Live soon about how to use social media to, to prepare, um, and a few others are in the pipeline as well. But if you want to watch back, then please do. If you have watched back, by the way, if you have seen these, just let me know how they've been, if they've been useful, um, and if there's any way that you want me to change them. But so far, I think, thankfully, most people have found them okay. So what are we going to do? Brief exam update as promised. We'll then go through a neurology update, do questions in the middle to keep you going, and we'll look at presentation, particularly if you're doing PLAB 2 um, CSA style um exams coming up and then we're going to talk about our offer we don't normally do offers on our gold pass package but we are tonight so we're doing 15 percent off our akt gold pass csa gold pass and plab 2 gold pass so these are already discounted packages that contain basically everything that you need for that exam 
and we're doing an additional 15 percent off that and there's only five for each so i want to go in through the the um the the codes later on i've had quite a few emails from people saying what about if i've already bought an online course um, how does that work? You can still use these offers and we'll refund you anything that you've paid for in the past, whether it be day course, audio course, online course, or poster. So what are we going to get through in neurology then? So tremors, MS, M, and D, M, G, the three M's as I like to call them, stroke, TIA, CNS, cancer, headaches, examination, neurologically, what we're looking at, presentation of falls, and then facial nerve palsy. Are there any areas of these that you struggle with in particular? Let me know. Which of these do you particularly struggle with or do you find them all OK or neuro in general? How do you find neuro? So a lot of you guys are saying MS, MND, MND, MS, stroke, TIA, um, headache takes long. It does. I hope you're not going to have a headache by today. We're going to go through quite a few headache types, um, MG, MND, all neurology. OK, so so a spread really um, across this falls, always vague. Yeah, interesting. New is interesting. Good. I'm glad you're going to find it interesting. Okay. So, quick update then. So, these slides were written yesterday. So, these are still cancelled. We still don't know when AKT and CS are going to be. Of course, the next scheduled one is October for AKT and then later on in the year, of course, for CSA. But there's some news going around um, from some of the AITs, the RCGP AITs this evening that there is a further conversation. You may have seen um, a report filed by the, AR the RCGP committee this week that went to BMA, BMA and, and NHS England and, and RCGP, of course, and a few other organizations. So things have moved forward. So the essential message that came out today is that there is something going to come imminent in terms of an announcement, probably, and that the exams may be at fairly short notice, i.e. the exams may be happening at some point soon. When it comes to AKT, they're looking at potential other ways of running it. For example, from the message that I saw, um, in places that are running the exam, but with social distancing in place, or looking at some specific setups that work for that particular exam because of the length of it, it's quite a long exam. So AKT potentially could be happening at some point soon, but they should hopefully give you some notice. CSA, they're really keen on getting these done because they don't want to delay um, people not CCTing. So from the message that I saw, a lot of discussions going on in the college to how this can be done at this point, what amendments need to be made. But the basic message that came out from the notes that I've been seeing from the from one of the AIT committee members is that get get on your revision because these things could happen um, at any time um, and with very, very short notice. Um, I've got a message saying I can't hear. Guys, give me a yes if you can hear just so I know that it's OK. Yes, loads of yeses. So um Dananji, i'd suggest if you could just switch off if, it's, if you can hear me a little bit just switch off and switch on re-log in it should sort the of search because people are okay so yes please get on akt and csa because it could happen at any point they're really keen to get these exams going by the sounds of it and there may just be amendments i know difficult with no dates but hopefully we should hear imminently stage three gp entry of course cancelled no face-to-face -face recruitment for gp but everything is on msra these are already running there's another week or so a couple of weeks left um, only based on sjt's not clinical. PLAB 2 still cancelled till 1st of July. We don't know whether that's going to happen even after this, but it's, it's provisionally opening on 1st of July and PLAB 1 is continuing um, as per the GMC guidance. Right, let us start officially then. So quick question one, how many types of tremor can you name? Just quick, just jot them all down. What can you Name in terms of tremor, we've got resting tremor, we have essential tremor, we have delirium, we have intentional tremor, we have pin rolling tremor, we have intention, resting, essential, intention, essential, resting, intention. Okay. So let's look at a presentation of tremor then. So what is a tremor? Firstly, unintentional rhythmic movement of a body part. We all think about hands and arms, but it could be any body part. The three main types of classification, there are other subclassifications as well, are rest, postural, and intention. So well done if you wrote those three. A rest tremor, classically worse at rest, of course, eases with activities. Classic is your Parkinsonian tremor, your pill rolling tremor. Postural tremor, worse with the posture. So when you hold your arms out in front of you, um, for example, if you're using salbutamol too much or your hypothyroidism, for example. And then intention tremor, worse on voluntary movements, so worse on intention. So for example, when you're doing your finger to nose touching, um, you get the tremor at that point. And, and classically, you think about cerebellar causes, but there are others as well. So rest tremor, worse on rest. 
postural tremor worse with the posture intention tremor worse on intention so remember those three benign essential tremor is just a variation it's not a particular category in itself so if you see someone who comes in an exam um, csa plab 2 who's got this tremor then of course you're going to be doing a few key things so um you'll be doing examinations and things but but don't forget lifestyle of course because um, there are lots of things that can trigger tremors or, or be an underlying reason looking at alcohol looking at substance misuse um, and remember with these kind of things make sure you tie questions in to the presentation rather than just saying mrs x can I check if you drink alcohol uh, mr x can I check if you do any illicit drugs it's just linking in mr x when people come in with these kind of tremors that can be caused by certain things that people do in their lifestyle. So I'm just going to run through a couple of things that we know can be linked. For example, alcohol. You know, it just sounds like you've genuinely taken an interest in that question and putting it in their context rather than can I just tick off the box about alcohol. So when we talk about psychosocial, we always talk about two ways of looking at psychosocial. What in their life could impact their medicine? And then how could their medicine be impacting their life? So, of course, you need to go in and dig out things like job, for example, because if you don't bring these things out early on in the first half, the potential is they'll come out in the second half with a minute to go, and then you realize that actually the reason they came in is because they're, a, I don't know, a carpenter and they're struggling to do it because they can't, you know, because the tremor is affecting their job, for example. Is it affecting driving? Is there a safety issue here? Maybe that's our um, thing that we need to pick up. They may not mention that until we ask the question or it comes late. And then is it affecting relationships, of course? And then, then, of course, is it leading to the other side of impact? Things like frustration, low mood, depression. Again, this could be the trigger for someone coming in. The tremor is not actually the thing that they came for. They may have had that for a long time, but now it's getting them down because of the effect on things like job or whatever it might be. So these often play a huge, huge part um, and are often looked over because you're thinking too much about the medicine. What's the diagnosis? What's the cause? But of course, look at other neurological signs and well, symptoms. So you know, paresthesia, weakness, all those kind of things, loss of sensation that you might be looking at in terms of a general neurological exam. And then you may do a focused or a generalized neurological examination, depending on what you find in the rest of your data gathering, upper limb, lower limb, cranial nerves, cerebellum. We'll touch on these some of these later on as we go through the webinar. And then, of course, management when it comes to tremor depends a little bit on what you, what you suspect the cause to be. Um, but ultimately, you may need to get neurology involved and explain what's going to happen when they probably go um, and see someone in a secondary care scenario. Quick question two, according to NICEQS, with what and at what dose would you treat an acute flare-up of MS? With what and at what dose? Have a guess if you're not sure. This is straight out of NICEQS, something that I certainly want to know for AKT, PLAB1. Okay, a lot of you guys are putting steroids. So yes, if we're looking at a type of steroid, what steroid? A lot of people putting dexamethasone, prednisolone. Some of you said methylprednisolone, which is correct. Well done. So some of you are saying prednisolone 30, steroids 40, prednisolone 40, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone. So the answer officially, if you look at NICEQS, and this could vary from person to person, is methylprednisolone 0.5 grams once a day for five days with secondary care advice, of course. But this may be something that is, has happened to somebody multiple times, and therefore it's something that could be prescribed with a bit of advice. So well done if you put methylprednisolone, well done if you put the dose right, 0.5 grams once a day for five days. So let's look at the three M's then. We'll start with MS, the uh, multiple sclerosis. These often can get confused. So MS. This is essentially demyelination and damage throughout the whole of the central nervous system. And you have those classic presentations. So if someone comes in with any of these, yes, of course, it could be other things, but always have MS in the back of your mind. Optic neuritis, so painful eye movements, maybe the, probably the commonest presentation that you may see in general practice of ultimate MS. Transverse myelitis, cerebellar symptoms um, and brainstem symptoms. Some of these are rare, some of these are more common, but the four classic presentations that you may get for MS, in primary care, we've got to be referring urgently. If we think someone has got MS, we need to be getting a neurological referral as soon as we can for various investigations like bloods, MRI scans, lumbar punctures, looking for those classic findings um, on MRA, on M MRI, sorry. If you get questions or you may get a role play of someone coming who's got diagnosed MS and then want to talk about medications, remember there are three main uh, groups as it were depending on what you're actually trying to treat so if you're looking at symptom control depending on what symptoms people have it may be things like antispasmodics anticholinergics this is of course tailored to the person and symptoms in front of you it might be disease modifying medication and the classic one to remember is beta interferon and then like we said in the acute phase you're looking at steroids for example 
what Nine CKS suggests. Methyl prednisolone, 0.5 grams once a day for five days. Hi, Manira, how are you doing? Quick question three, does MND present with upper or lower motor neuron signs? Just quickly jot your thoughts in the answer, upper or lower, upper or lower. So we have a lot of people saying lower, we have a lot of people saying lower, a few people are saying upper, a few people are saying upper, but well done to all of you who have put both. You can get a mixture of upper and or lower motor neuron signs when it comes to motor neuron disease. So it's a neurodegenerative condition, of the brain and the spinal cord, and you get a mixture classically of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs. And we'll talk about what these signs are um, a little bit later on in the webinar. Very poor prognosis, generally two to three years. The key medication that you want to be remembering with MND is Riluzole, but often you're trying to treat, of course, the, the issues that the patient in front of you is having. So it could be swallowing issues, so looking at using salt, um, gastrostomy, for example, physio and splints, depending on whether it's limb issues they're having, uh, medications for, for symptoms like spasticity and cramps and right up to help with breathing as well with NIV um, if they're struggling um, with that part. So management very much dependent on the symptoms and the issues in front of you. Quick question four, you refer a patient to neurology for suspected MG. Can you think of an investigation that they may undergo in clinic? So they may come and say, doctor, I've been told to have this test. What is it all about? Or I've had the results of this test. What is it all about? What could they be talking about? So we have nerve conduction studies. We have EMG runner. We have tensilon test, Nicola. We have um, edrophonium test side, tensilon anticholinergic inhibitors, nerve conduction studies, nerve conduction studies, EMG, peak explosive flow rate, spirometry, EMG. So yes, yeah, so they'll have a lot of tests probably. But classically, you may be thinking of your classic tensilon test and things like EMG as well, which we'll come on to in a second. So MG, myasthenia gravis, is an autoimmune disorder which eventually leads to muscle weakness. And it can affect any muscle, really. Classically, you might get the ocular muscles, and that's what um, one of the, involves one of the tests that you talk about. So eye muscles get, or eyes become droopy after, after a while, respiratory muscles, so they may present with breathing issues eventually. And then general muscles as well, so they may just present with, with fatigue, for example. How do you diagnose it? So acetylcholine receptor antibodies are something that may be done in terms of a blood test, EMG, of course, electromyelography, tensilon test. So basically in tensilon test, you give some short acting anticholinesterase medications, for example, edrophonium. So if you're at edrophonium test, well done. And you get a quick improvement. So if you're getting muscle fatigue and you give something like a short acting anticholinesterase medication, you see quick improvement. And that could be, um, that's the classic tensilon test. Therefore, medications, are based on um, oral anticholinesterase medications, so things like pyridostigmine or neostigmine. So your stigmines, classically, when it comes to MG. So MS, MND, and MG, worth getting those um, clear in your mind. And the three key drugs to remember that we always put together in a bracket, MS, think about beta interferon, MND, think about riluzole, and MG, think about stigmines, like neostigmine and pyridostigmine, worth putting those in your mind. Let's move on to stroke then. So a lot of people put stroke in TIA as an area that they really struggle with. So let's break this down and make sure you're ready for it if it comes up in AKT, CSA, PLAB2 or whatever exam that it is that's coming up in the near future. So stroke, rapidly developing neurological deficit could be focal or global, lasting for over 24 hours, of course. Anything under 24 hours, you're looking at TIA, which we'll talk about in a second. All the cardiovascular risk factors, we covered all of these in the first webinar, cardiology, of course, you've got your modifiable risk factors, you've got your non-modifiable risk, risk factors, um, all of these are going to put you at higher risk. 85% or the majority of strokes, of course, end up being ischemic, usually because of an embolus, but you can, of course, get bleeds that you don't want to miss and have very different managements, of course. The classic presentations, headache, confusion, unilateral weakness, dysartha, diplopia, but don't forget posterior circulation strokes. When we did the um, ENT webinar a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about this, um, a lot of posterior circulation strokes are missed because we're looking at things like vertigo um, and, and general dizziness and things that actually are put down to ENT issues, but, but they end up being posterior circulation strokes. So don't miss those if you get it in, a, in an exam. Urgent admission, of course, for CT MRI to rule out um, the bleed. Um, if you can exclude the bleed and they present fast enough, say, for example, I think it's four and a half hours and they don't have any contraindications, then you may be giving alteplase once they get to secondary care. So tissue plasminogen activators. But much more likely you're going to get someone coming in post 
stroke, talking about, doctor, what can I do to try and prevent this happening again? Or why have I been started on these medications? What are they all about? So remember, for ongoing management, this is for stroke and for TIA, aspirin 300 milligrams for two weeks acutely. This is, of course, if they're not, didn't, that, it's not a bleed. Once they've had their two weeks, then you move on to long-term antiplatelet treatment or, 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 or reducing the risk of it happening again. So clopidogrel is first line. Clopidogrel, 75 milligrams once a day, long-term. And of course, think about PPI alongside. If someone can't take clopidogrel, then you go for a combination next, aspirin plus dipyridimol, 200 milligrams BD, long-term. If someone can't take clopidogrel and either one of these two, then you just go for single treatment alone. So either dipyridimol alone or aspirin alone. So if you look at your three steps, you've got clopidogrel line one, you've got aspirin plus dipyridimol line two, and then you've got aspirin or dipyridimol line three. And of course, this is now secondary prevention criteria. So again, going back to the cardiology webinar that we did, you're looking at secondary prevention statin doses, so atorvastatin, 80 milligrams. And as we mentioned before, you're looking for that reduction of non-HDL cholesterol by 40% at three months, we should be treating all other coexisting conditions. Of course, hypertension, NICK suggests the target systolic should be 130 if you're looking at a post-stroke scenario. So remember, if you get a someone coming in post-stroke in a, in a CSA type scenario, for example, yes, think about the medication, but don't forget to think about all those other things that you may talk about in terms of post-stroke, like fatigue and depression and driving issues and swallowing and problems with pain in limbs and you know all those other things that um, may be more worrying in someone's mind than what medication they're taking. Our medical brain, of course, tends to treat the medicine, whereas remember in things like CSA, PLAB2, you're trying to manage a situation, not just a condition. And we talk a lot about this um, in the training that we do. Quick question five, 47 year old Mrs. HL has a history of COPD, renal cancer and factor eight deficiency. She presents five days after what sounds like a TIA. When should she be seeing a stroke specialist? When should she be seeing a stroke specialist? What do you think? So thank you for your answer. Said Abba, Amir, Sujata, Nancy, Rana, Amrit, Shireen, Nicola, Thomas, Temitope, Amna, Rishma, they're flying in, Olga. So we've got a lot of variation of answers here. So we've got seven days, 24 hours, 48 hours, seven days, two weeks, immediately, same day, one week, 24 hours, immediately. So lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of range here. The answer, and well done if you got this, is immediately. This person needs to be admitted to hospital there and then because of the fact they have factor eight deficiency, i.e. hemophilia A, which is a bleeding disorder, they need to go in there and then. This is a high, high risk of bleed, therefore they need to go in. So well done if you put immediately. If you put 24 hours, I can see why you think that, um, but we just missed that key element in the question. So TIA, same risk factors, of course, as a stroke, all your classical cardiovascular risk factors, most of ischemic, because remember, bleeds are unlikely to settle. So most TIAs are going to be ischemic by nature. If it's a bleed, it's probably gonna carry on and progress into a stroke. Features, and that's why you can that's why you can be so confident in giving aspirin in the community because it's unlikely to be a, a bleed if it's a TIA. So classic features again: weakness, syncope, dysphagia, vertigo, hemonymous hemianopia. Remember when you can't see the both lefts or both rights of your vision. Um, amyophis is a classic TIA. That classic story of there's a curtain coming down in front of my vision. All classic TIA. Don't want to miss these. Um, ABCD2 score used to be obviously the thing to do um, even in primary care, whereas it still it still might be done in hospital to to look at risk. But in terms of primary care management, remember you don't you shouldn't be doing ABCD2 any score. We should be because what ABCD2 score is looking at risk is it high, low, or medium? But now what they say is that all TIA is high risk regardless of score. But if you're looking at the old system, then a score of four and above is considered higher risk. But now TIA management is not based on ABCD. Of course, it's based on when they had the TIA add a couple of additional things. So if someone had a TIA in the last seven days, then you should be given aspirin 300 unless they can't take it. And they should be seeing a stroke specialist within 24 hours. So that's why a lot of you put 24 hours because you were just looking at the five day thing here. But a couple of examples where you need to get them in there. And then if they've got a bleeding disorder like von Willebrand's or hemophilia, like we said, or they're taking something like warfarin, 
or if they've got crescendo TIA. So if, for example, you're in a CSA scenario and someone comes in and gives you a classic, classic description of a TIA two days ago, completely recovered, always, always, always ask, in the previous seven days, have you had anything else similar to this or any of the questions that I've just asked you? It's amazing how many times, for example, two days before that episode where they had weakness on their left side, they had a, a little bit of dysphasia that they almost just played off. But that's the second TIA. That's now crescendo TIA. That is admission. So please don't miss that scenario of crescendo TIA. If someone had a TIA over a week ago, then they should be seeing a stroke specialist within seven days. Hopefully that makes sense. No one's written anything for about a minute. Just give me a yes if you are still with me so I know that you are there. Yes, good, 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 good. So hopefully that clears stroke and TIA. Is that okay with stroke and TIA? Just give me a yes and nod if you're okay for me to carry on. Okay, great. Quick question six. A 32-year-old male has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. Which tumor types most commonly present in this age group? 32-year-old male, brain tumor, what do you think? So thank you, Amrit Sai, Shireen. Hey, Donna, how are you doing? Manira Abba, Miliam Ragesh, thank you for your answers. Thanks, Sari. Thanks, Rana. So, again, we have a range of answers. We have gliomas, we have neurofibromas, glioblastoma, medulloblastoma, meningioma, gliomas. Okay, so a big, big range. So, if you're looking at an adult, the commonest ones are probably gliomas, meningiomas, and METs as well. METs I probably wouldn't put in this age group, but if this person was slightly, slightly older, 60, 70, I'd probably put METs there as one of my first choices. So brain tumors have it in two peaks, in children and in late middle age. So in children, classically things like astrocytomas or medulloblastomas may come, but of course this other ones may happen, but in adults it's classic gliomas, meningiomas, and later on METs. What does nice CKS say? about suggested CNS cancer then. So if you see an adult and you think they've got CNS cancer, then we should be doing a two week direct access MRI or CT if it's not available, if they have progressive subacute loss of central neurological function, for example, visual or motor loss. Now, this might be a bit of a challenge because say you see someone with some of these symptoms, a lot of stuff is gonna go through your mind, isn't it? We've just talked about um, TIA where you look at visual issues. So it's quite difficult, but the guidance says two week direct access MRI, but I suspect in real life, if you see anyone with these kind of things, you're gonna get them in the same day anyway. Children, um, obviously a, a lot tied to on, on, on deadline. So 48 hour appointment if they have newly abnormal cerebellar or other central neurological function. Worth getting these two things right if you go into questions, right? So we're just about hitting halfway. Just a quick request for help for you guys, if that's okay, guys. We have a Facebook page. It's our own personal Facebook page, Dr. Amin Aurora. If you could, if you don't mind, if you find these webinars helpful, I'd really appreciate if you could just search this out on Facebook, like the page, and please, the most important thing, write a review about these webinars. It really, really help us out just to spread the word about these free webinars so many, many more people can watch them. I really request if you can, if you can't, don't worry, but if you can, I really, really, really appreciate it. Now, some of the people have been asking about, so before we go on a quick break, our offers for today. So what are our gold packages? Our gold packages are basically everything that we do or have for a particular exam to try and cover all bases to try and make sure you, you max your potential out for your particular exam. And we have five for each. So we have our AKT gold package, which is normally, if you add up all of these products, it's 1068. Normally that's discounted to a bundle of 849. I know a lot of you guys have, have got this already. We've further discounted it today by 15% for five code uses only to 721. What does that include? A Big Mock AKT course, London, Manchester, or Birmingham. This is of any date, any choice. The moment AKT exams are re-announced, we're gonna re-announce our courses. And if it's not gonna be a face-to-face, -face, it's gonna be an online-based one. So either way, you get your Big Mock AKT course, you get all three of your online courses, it says for 12 months, but actually, as you guys know, in April, if you purchase anything, you get double. So really, you'd have 24 months of your AKT Clinical Crammer online, AKT Super Stats online, and AKT Admin online as well with PDF notes. You get unlimited um, use of our three AKT audiobooks, AKT Clinical, AKT Stats, and AKT Admin on the go, and you get our 60-day AKT revision process. So all that comes at 721, and if that's going to help you get your exam, then, then hopefully it's gonna help. There are only five code uses for this web gold 15 for AKT gold package. 
What about CSA Gold Package? Again, 15% off. Normally, it's 1049. Discounted generally is 839. It's a further 15% off just for today for five people, 713. What does it include? A CSA Immersion Day course, whenever that is of your choice in whichever venue. 12 months, but really 24 months if, if, because it's bought in April of CSA 125 online course, CSA On The Go audiobook, Medical How To Explain audiobook. Six months of our CSA online case bank that you can use within your study groups. And then of course, our 60 day CSA revision process. So our complete CSA one-stop package to make sure you max your potential in your CSA exam. And then PLAB2 as well. We have our PLAB2 gold package. So what does this include? Our PLAB2 communication skills course, again, London, Manchester, or Birmingham. Our PLAB2 communication skills online course, up to 24 months again, that would be PLAB2 communication skills audiobook and medical how to explain your audiobook. Normally 377. Normally discounted bundle is 320. Today for five people, 272. Now, I had a lot of questions come in saying, what if we've bought some of these things already. So say, for example, AKT Gold, you've already got the three AKT audiobooks. All we would do is once you purchase it at the discounted rate, we would go back and refund you the amount that you paid on any one of these products. So if you, for example, bought the AKT course and you've got it booked and you've got the online courses, we would refund these two and you end up paying 721 and you get everything included. So it is for anybody whether you have bought something or not. I'm going to leave those. Oh, one final thing before I go for the break. Remember, if you don't want the, the, the full package, you've got three days left to get double on any of our online courses. So you've got clinical online um, stats and, and admin for AKT, CSA or PLAB2. One, three, six or 12 months. We double it if you purchase it in April. So a few days left for that as well. Right. Two minutes, guys. Get a quick drink and we'll come and we'll read go. Welcome back, guys. Hopefully you're ready for the second part. We've got headaches coming up, which is an area that I know a lot of people struggle with. Just a quick post has gone up in our main GP training support group. Um, if you're not a part of it, then I'd recommend you join. It's just called, if you just type in Aurora GP training support, um, it's probably the biggest GP training support group in the UK. A post had just gone up from one of the ICGP AATs talking about the meeting they had and the updates with AKT and CSA. So I'd really recommend that you go and have a look at that. Um, it's got a few answers in terms of the different ways that the exams might be happening um, in the next couple of months. Okay, so we're going to move on to a headache. Give people another few seconds to come back. But I think most of you have. By the way, the CSA goals, we've had three AKTs go already and two CSAs and just the one PLAB too. So we've got some uh, people have already taken um, use of these things. Just to let you know, these are going to go very, very fast. Okay, so let's look at a headache then. So again, really really classic presentation in GP land and it could be a benign headache that's been there for months and months and months or it could be one that bang came yesterday and it's one that you can't afford to miss so of course red flags are really key and even if someone has a really long history of tension headache they come in every couple of months and you think this is just another presentation tension, always got to rule these things out because remember the first assessment of these types of exams is safety we can't assume that someone's asked all these and we can't assume that things haven't changed in the last maybe one week since they came last time of course classic stuff that you all know early morning headaches uh, headaches that are sudden onset new onset over the age of 50 vision changes recent head injury vomiting neurological symptoms neck stiffness fever there's a whole bunch of others that you might want to get in there so mrs x we can tell a lot of um, things about a headache just by examination i want to do a couple of things if that's okay um, and, and start examining. Remember, when we do examination, particularly things like CSA and PLAB2, we can waste a lot of time doing the talking bit. So Mrs. X, do you mind if I examine you? Um, yeah, uh, uh, okay, doctor, what do you need to do? I need to do this, 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 and this, this, this. Um, okay, and then we look at the examiner, and the examiner looks back at you, and you get a bit stressed, and then you start examining. Now, that's about 40, 50 seconds gone, whereas you could have just done that all in one go. Mrs. X, if it's okay, I'd like to examine you. What I'd be liking to do is this, 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 and this. Um, and then put the chaperone line if you want to, and then go, and then just start examining. Don't look at anybody, don't look at the examiner, just keep going, and you can save a lot of time. BP fundi neuro, I think a minimum for any headache that you see, but there may be some other things that you do as well. Are there any signs of raised ICP? And of course, look at temporal arteries if you're worrying about temporal arteries. We'll talk about that in a second. Psychosocial links, of course, if it's, mainly if it's not an acute, if it's a chronic headache in, in particular, 
Um, recent stresses, recent tensions, of course. Does this person wear glasses? Have they had an eye check recently? Have they changed contact lenses? Have they changed prescription? It could be simple things like these that we overlook because we're looking for the more sinister um, diagnoses. Computer screens, you know, what do they do for a job? Are they looking at screens all day? Is there any time in correlation with that? Dehydration, do they drink enough water in the day? Maybe they're just you know, so busy at work that they, they don't have a drink from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I don't know. Um, caffeine, too much caffeine, of course, alcohol, all these kind of things are really important to bring in to a headache scenario. Again, if you don't bring these things in early, then they will eventually come out, but they're going to come out with two minutes ago. Oh, doctor, you don't think it's my glasses, do you? Oh, right, gosh, I didn't notice. You wear glasses? Why, what's happening? Oh, I got new glasses three weeks ago. Does that happen at the same? Does that coincide with a headache? I think it does, doctor. Oh, right, okay, I've missed everything. See, you don't want that to happen, so you've got to go in and get these things out before they come and bite you a little bit later. Medication in two ways, of course. Have they taken any medication that's helped in particular, but are they using any particular medication that potentially could be making this worse? And we'll talk about medication overuse um, headaches in a second and of course consider a headache diary if you're not sure where you're going and it's a picture of a chronic condition get them to do a headache diary well they'll look at these kind of things i suppose if they can't give you answers there and then quick question seven can you name two options for migraine prophylaxis according to nice cks two options for migraine prophylaxis according to nice cks we have uh, do, 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 do. Propanol, topiramate, sumatriptan. You know what? Apologies. Apologies. This question was supposed to say Can you think of two options for second line migraine prophylaxis? Second line migraine prophylaxis. Um, propanol, topiramate. Yes, you're all right. That's all first line. What about second line? Give me some second lines. So we have sumatriptan, we have amitriptyline. Amitriptyline used to be second line. Shirin used to be. Um, acupuncture, topiramate, that's first line. Propanolol, first line. Acupuncture, CBT, CBT, sumatriptan. Well done if you put either CBT, acupuncture, or riboflavin. Amitriptyline, by the way, if you put amitriptyline, used to be down here. It's now up here. So let's look at migraine then. It's a very classic thing that we will see in primary care, usually lasts between four to 72 hours, usually less than no more towards this side than this side. Um, unilateral pulsating with or without an aura, for example, vision uh, issues or paresthesia, photophobia, vomiting, the classic things that you'll see with migraine. Episodic, less than 15 days per month. Chronic migraine defined as more than 15 days per month. What are you going to do acutely? So analgesia, brufen 400, aspirin 900, paracetamol, 1,000 milligrams, one of those. Triptan, either alone or in combination with an NSAID or paracetamol. And the, and the dose you should be thinking of is 50 to 100 milligrams of sumatriptan, orally first choice. And of course, then you treat the other features that they may be getting with migraine, for example, antiemetics. If you get questions or case on prophylaxis, now you have three options now, topiramate, propanolol, or amitriptyline. It used to just be two. And then second line, you can either think of behavioral interventions, acupuncture, or things like riboflavin. Medication overuse, like we talked about earlier, so sometimes told to us a rebound headache. So classically, it's opiates that are going to do these, but things like triptans can, and less commonly NSAIDs as well. It's usually a daily headache with usually daily analgesia use. That's the kind of pattern that you pick up over time. It's like a tension type headache, so you can be confused with tension type headaches, and often there may be an element of both. They're really stressed, they're getting headaches in the first place, and now they're taking medication as well. So it can be quite difficult to split the two. Classically worse in the morning. What are you going to do really is re educate, I suppose. So explain what's going on, talk about and plan a withdrawal period, like a detox period, but it's got to be for a decent amount of time. There's no point doing it for a week and then thinking it's going to get better, at least a month. Be really honest that you're probably going to get rebound headaches in this period. It's not going to be easy. We can give you some medication to help you on the way, but the last thing we want to do is give you more medication and make the problem worse and get you back on that track. So it's about being honest and open that this could be a challenge, but in the longer scheme of things, we want to try and get you off the need for all medications, and that should help with that dialogue moving forward. Tension headache, of course, very common, usually bilateral, 30 minutes up to about seven days, no other features. Usually paracetamol, aspirin, or NSAIDs, but not opioids, of course, and tension headaches. Make sure you're careful under 16 should we have an aspirin. If you get scenarios or questions on prophylaxis of tension headache, think about acupuncture up to 10 sessions, and then amitriptyline between 10 and 75 milligrams once a day, 
can be used off label. Quick question eight. A 51 year old male has classic temporal arteritis symptoms. He has vision changes. What dose of prednisolone does he need as a stat dose? 51, vision change, giant cell arteritis. So we have again a range of answers. We have 60, 50, 60 to 100, 80, 200, 40. I think the rest are all the same, or all one of those anyway. So guidance has changed. As of March 2020, the doses have slightly changed. So it's worth bearing this in mind. We just did a, a video on this three or four days ago. I think there was a question in, in our AKT group about the new guidelines. It's just, uh, by the way, I, um, the, the reason someone put a question in the in the AKT group was that our AKT Clinical Crammer online course was, has been updated this week. So it, it did say the old guidelines, but now it says the new guidelines. So that's why we had the question. So the dose is 60 to 100. So well done, you put anything between 60 and 100 milligrams. Temporal arteritis, so GCA, um, it's a systemic immune-mediated vasculitis that affects both medium and large size arteries. You don't really know what happens, but there's a strong link with PMR, so polymyalgia rheumatica, any case or scenario where you're getting people with um, stiffness and you know, shoulders bilaterally, Think about ruling out temporal arteritis as well as PMR. Classic presentation of temporal headache, fever, malaise, myalgia, jaw claudication, so pain when you're eating and scalp tenderness. So these two are really important actually to, to, to ask in a, in a history because they might be the only features that make you think about temporal arteritis. Of course, the main risk is main risk that we think about is permanent vision loss, um, but it also bumps up your CBD risk as well. So important to get all this under control. The American College of Rheumatology has five features that they put together to try and diagnose. And if you have three out of five, then you can diagnose temporal arteritis. Age over 50, new onset headache, some kind of temporal artery abnormality like tenderness or thickening of the of the temporal artery area, raised ESR, and ultimately a positive temporal artery biopsy so what do the new guidelines say then so if you don't the first thing you look at in a question is eye symptoms or not if someone does not have eye symptoms and it's and you think they've got temporal arteritis your dose is 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisolone you you try and you should try and admit everybody with temporal arteritis now according to the new guidelines but maximum they've got to be seeing someone like a rheumatologist within three days However, like this guy in the question, if you have eye symptoms, the dose is 60 to 100 milligrams as a one-off dose, and they must go in and see ophthalmology on that day. The other change that's happened in terms of CKS is where it talks about antiplatelets. Previously, like literally as of three, four weeks ago, guidance suggested that aspirin 75 is needed for everyone, whereas now CKS suggests that routine use of antiplatelets is not recommended, and it will be something um, based on um, secondary care advice. So it's worth remembering those couple of changes for giant cell arteritis. What is ACR? The American College of Rheumatology. They have diagnostic features for quite a few rheumatological conditions. Let's look at neurological examination then and a couple of things that there's obviously loads you can talk about from examination, but a couple of things that I just wanted to point out. So we talked about upper and motor neuron lesion signs when we talked about MND um, at the beginning of the webinar. So if you get an upper motor neuron lesion versus a low motor neuron lesion, what are the features you're gonna get? So tone is obviously, so hypertonia, everything, obviously everything goes up in an upper motor neuron, or think of it as everything goes up and everything goes down in a low motor neuron. So hypertonia, high tone versus hypotonia, low tone, hyperreflexia in upper motor neuron, um, low or diminished or absent reflexes in lower, you get paralysis in both, but it's spastic paralysis in upper versus flaccid paralysis in lower. And you don't get muscle atrophy in upper motor neuron lesions, but you get lots of muscle atrophy in lower motor neuron lesion signs. So it's worth remembering the two presentations in case you get it in a CSA exam, for example. And then remember, you have your MRC scale for muscle power. So for example, you may get a question in AKT, or you may get a scenario where someone has come back from a neurology clinic and they said, doctor, I've been told I've got grade three muscle power. What does that mean? So you have to kind of know what these mean. So grade zero to five, zero is no muscle contraction at all. Grade five is full and normal power. And then of course you've got stepwise drops in between. So contraction, but no joint movement. Joint movement possible with gravity eliminated. Movement overcomes gravity, but not examiner resistance. 
can overcome some examiner resistance and then full and normal power. So worth just reviewing your MRC score as well. Quick question nine, what classically causes a waddling gait? Can you think of something that should spring to your mind as a condition when you get a description of a waddling gait in a question? So we have cerebellar ataxia, we have Parkinson's, we have proximal myopathy, we have pregnancy, we have hip problems, hip pain, cerebellar. So we've got a couple of things that do have specific gait. So for example, um, hip pain, you're thinking probably of a Trendelenburg gait there. Um, cerebellar problems, you're thinking of your a classic ataxic gait. Um, alcohol, alcohol intoxication, muscular dystrophy, proximal myopathy. So the classic one that you think of is proximal myopathy. Um, that's the classic thing that should should stick to your mind. So basically what happens in proximal myopathy, if you think about it, your, your quad muscles are getting um, weak. So you, when you walk, you, 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 could just, you might as well just get up and try and walk without using your quads and you'll see why that kind of waddling gait appearance happens. So it's worth knowing a key few gates in terms of questions. So your cerebellum is your classic wide base ataxic gait. Parkinsonian is that kind of shuffling festinant gait, very small shuffling steps. Proximal myopathy, like we talked about. Um, if you can name, what's the um, the bone condition that's classic with proximal myopathy? If anyone knows that, just jot it down. Um, spastic paraplegia, scissor gait. High stepping is your foot drop. So when you so your high stepping gait is because you've got foot drop, coron perineal nerve, palsy. Um, and then antalgic or Trendelenburg gait is the one that you classically get um, with hip pain. So people are putting Duchenne muscular dystrophy, people are putting um, rickets. I'm just looking for one more, one beginning with O. Tell me, what do you think, beginning with O? Classic with proximal myopathy. Someone want move chain, what, someone can meet to me before I move on. Hypothyroidism, no. Osteomalacia, Samuel, well done. Osteomalacia, classically a surgery, proximal myopathy, classically presents with a waddling gait. Well done if you've got osteomalacia. A few people have put in osteoporosis, um, not osteoporosis, osteomalacia. Some people put osteopenia as well. Osteoporosis, osteopenia, osteomalacia. People get confused with those three conditions. Um, if we do an MSK webinar, I'll make sure I cover those three. Quick question 10, a patient presents with recurrent falls, which or what kind of non-clinical options might you discuss in a management plan for a case like this? Think CSA, think uh, PLAB2, what kind of things non-clinically wise might you talk about? So we've got OT assessment, thanks Katie, we've got vision, thanks Samuel. What else have we got? What else have we got? OT, physio, um, vision again, home hazards, hydration, fragility assessment, physio, medication, balance strength, walking aids, footwear, shoes. So well done, loads of stuff coming through. Walking aids, FRAC score we've got, so we can think about osteoporosis here, um, hearing problems, uh, postural hypotension, falls clinic. Yeah, loads of stuff, well done, Lo well, loads of stuff. So. Falls classically can be quite challenging to manage, and there's lots of things we'll come on to in a second in terms of what you can help, but it all depends on the kind of assessment that you do. So if someone comes in and saying, doctor, I'm falling all the time, it's a challenge to do in, in, a, in a 10 minute or eight minute consultation and exam, but there's lots of things you've got to consider. So firstly, is it really a fall? Like, is it a genuine fall? Is it a trip? Or is it things that actually are a bit more, you know, that we have to pay a bit more attention to? I, I, is someone collapsing? out of the blue? Is someone losing consciousness all the time? Is there an underlying arrhythmia that's leading to this? Is it vertigo leading to spinning first and then falling because of dizziness? Could it be, you know, crescendo TIAs like we talked about? Like what generally is happening? What people say is a fall, maybe a hundred different things. What are they going to come um, and ask us? Why am I falling, doctor? So we have to bear lots of things in mind. Could they have visual impairment? Could they have cognitive impairment? Could they, could be, you know, frailty? Could they have a condition that affects mobility or balance, going something going on with their ears, for example? And could it be medication related? Of course, postural hypertension because of over medicalization. Now, it might not be the falls that really bother them. It could be the, the impact of the falls themselves. So, you know, asking these kind of questions is really important. How has this impacted your confidence? Maybe 
they're just so low on confidence because of the worry of falling that they're not going out of their house, they're leading to becoming socially isolated and they're feeling really depressed. Like that could be the actual reason why they've come in to see you, not, not the fall itself. And you've got a much bigger management to think about now. Um, does it make you feel low, of course? Are you still getting out about These kind of questions should be volunteered if you can, rather than it just kind of coming out later saying, doctor, I, should I be going out or not? I'm a little bit worried. And that happens a minute, you know, with two minutes to go. What are the kind of things that you might think about? Of course, it does depend a little bit on what you figured out. So strength and balance training, some people write that. Um, home assessment, looking for things like hazards and, and are there particular aids that could be used at home? Uh, medication reviews, of course, can we cut down things that aren't really helping? Uh, vision assessment, of course, um, talking about family, relatives, who's around, what's your support system? Um, and of course, ultimately things like fall alarm. So a huge host of things that you might be able to talk about in a scenario like this. How do you comment? Christine, just how you've commented, just where you've written there, just write something down. I should have said at the beginning, um, there's a few questions coming in. I tend not to answer questions there and then unless it's a really quick one um, because it kind of disrupts the flow. And I tend to go back afterwards and try and go through comments at that point. So I promise I'll be doing that at the end of the webinar. Quick question level, nearly there. Stay with me. Hope you're still awake. Hope you're still listening and taking things in. You decide to treat a patient with Bell's palsy with steroids. Within what time frame of symptom onset is this recommended? So streams of answers coming in. Abbasadi, Sandeep Minera, Olga, Rana, Shireen, Sai, Christy, Mama, Surbi, Dr. Dananje, Katie, Wilson, Sajata, Nancy, Vino, uh, Enid, Vinadini, Sadia, Enid, Nicola. Thank you so much for everybody who has put the right answer. Most of you put 72 hours. Some of you have put 24 hours, some of you have put eight days, five days, 48 hours, but most of you have correctly said 72 hours for things like prednisolone. So facial nerve palsy can be, of course, an upper motor neuron facial nerve palsy, or it could be a lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. Don't always think about Bell's palsy just because someone's got a facial nerve palsy. So upper motor neuron problems like stroke, brain tumors, MS, they can lead to upper motor neuron facial nerve palsies as opposed to low motor neuron ones like things like herpes zoster or your Ramsey Hunt syndrome. I remember Bell's palsy is idiopathic. So you've got to kind of rule out other things before you think this is a Bell's palsy presentation. So what happens? Weak facial muscles on that side, unable to close your eye, facial droop. Um, you have problems with taste on the anterior two thirds of your tongue and they may come with intolerance to high pitch sound. So what's the difference between upper and lower? Remember upper gives upper sparing. So with your lower motor neuron um, facial nerve palsy, the whole of one side of the face is affected, the whole of it, the top and the bottom. So they can't wrinkle their forehead because the upper part is affected. Whereas an upper motor neuron lesion, sorry, upper motor neuron facial nerve palsy, they you get upper sparing. So the upper part is not affected. So someone can still wrinkle their forehead. So you've got to do that assessment before you start jumping into a Bell's palsy diagnosis. If you're gonna manage Bell's palsy, then you help with some of these things. So for example, if they're not able to close their eye, then the eye could get dry. So you talk about lubrication, you talk about patches to keep it closed overnight, for example. And then like we said, steroids, if they present in the first 72 hours. Is Bell's upper or lower? It's lower, Ali, it's a lower, um, uh, lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. Well done. So we've got through a fair bit, tremors. The three M's, MS, M, and D, M, G, stroke, TIA, CNS, cancer, headache, examination findings, falls, and facial nerve palsy. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I want to go through all the questions now. Just a quick reminder about our daily emails. Please do use these. We um, One just went out at 8 o'clock today. There's one at 8 o'clock every day. Quick revision teaching email. Have a look. All of our Facebook stuff, please, once again, if you can, um, like our Facebook page, Dr. Amin or our Facebook page, and please leave a review about these webinars. We're really, really grateful to receive that. If you can, these are the offers, 15%. Let me just check how many we've got left. Um, do, 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 do. Plab, we've got three. Um, we have one of each, guys, AKT and CSA left. One each, if you're looking for that. The code is WEBGOLD15. Remember, three days left to get your doubled um, online course uh, subscription. You can get up to 24 months if you purchase before the end of April. Thank you so much. Same time next Tuesday. Um, we're not sure what we're going to do next Tuesday, actually. I will know within the next hour because we'll be able to sign up to it within the next hour, but I'm not sure. It'll be in the email that goes out after this uh, with a watch back. The code, remember, WebGold15. 
I am going to stay around now and ask some questions. But if you need to shoot off, thank you so much um, for attending. Hope to see you next week. Um, again, give me some feedback. Is there any way that a lot of requests coming in for a few different women's health, peds, musculoskeletal? We'll try and look and see what probably the most requested one is, and we'll do that next week. Um, so thank you. I'm going to just shoot out and then uh, go through the questions. So